Hi, everybody. This is Allison from Alley Care Creations. How are you? Please like, share, and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so just yet. It's okay. Try to subscribe. And if you get anything from my work, uh, connect the dot in Epiphany, a mind explosion, a new book to read, a new author to explore, please consider supporting my work. All the links are at the bottom of the description. Today, we're going to start with The Secret Doctrine, book two, stanza two, Nature Unaided Fails. Before I begin, make sure you check out my website. I got cool pieces that I haven't yet put up because it's been busy around here. Um, but check out my website. If you're interested in something, alleycatcreations 211com email me so that I can create something really fabulous for you. Also, um, take heed, as a lot of books are starting to end, um, I have some books that I am now looking to get a fair use uh, where that, which means I can read it without having copyright issues. Um, cause I want to do the Nag Hammadi scriptures and the Egyptian book of the dead. I won't obviously read the spell casting that comes out of it, but there is some stuff there and I'm trying to find PDFs and, or fair use content to be able to read it. And if not, because that's the case with a lot of books, I will kind of do what I did with the law of one and do my interpretation thereof. Uh, but that that does take time to read and then make notes. So we'll see how that goes. I just wanted to put that out there. Um, I mean, this is going to take a year and a day to to read. <laughs> But for, for those who like the other content on my channel, I am rearing end of, I have books, but I can't read them, but they're going to, they're just, you can't not not read them, right? So stay tuned. And also just take note because stanza one was so, like her work is long and it doesn't like want to end. I'm going to probably have to do the same thing and cut this in the middle and split the stanza depends on each of the stanzas because, you know, it gets difficult. <laughs> and I need glasses really bad. Sorry, guys. I am just adjusting my screen so I can read the book with my gift. This is just fantastic. I need glasses. Can't afford them. Okay. Nature unaided fails. And I have to write this down so I don't get lost. Sorry, guys. I'm not prepared to that. After enormous periods, the earth creates monsters. The creators are displeased. They dry the earth. The forms are destroyed by them. The first great tides, the beginning of incrustation. The wheel world for 30 horrors of years. 300 million. It constructed rupas, forms, Soft stones that harden minerals, hard plants that soften vegetation, visible from invisible insects and small lives. She, the earth, shook them off her back wherever they overran the mother. After 30 cores or of years, she turned round. She laid on her back, on her side. She would call no sons of heaven she would ask no sons of wisdom. She created from her own bosom. She evolved watermen, terrible and bad. Interesting. 
This relates to an inclination of the axis of which there were several to a consequent deluge and chaos on earth, having, however, no reference to primeval chaos in which monsters, half human, half animal were generated. We find it mentioned in the Book of the Dead and also in the Chaldean account of creation on the Kuthra tablets, however mutilated. It is not even allegory. Here we have facts that are found repeated in the account of Primander, as well as in the Chaldean tablets of creation. The verses may also be checked by the cosmogony as given by Barosis, Barosos, which has been disfigured out of recognition by Ezebos. I'm totally butchering names here. But some of the features of which may yet be found in fragments left by ancient Greek authors, Apollodorus, Alexander, Polyhistor, the watermen, terrible and bad, who were the production of physical nature alone a result of the evolutionary impulse and the first attempt to create man, the crown, the aim and goal of all animal life on earth are shown to be failures in our stanzas. Do we not find the same in that Barosian cosmogony denounced with such vehemence as the culmination of the heathen absurdity? And yet who of the evolutionists can say that things in the beginning have not come to pass as they are described? That as maintained in the Puranas, the Egyptian and Chaldean fragments, and even in Genesis, there have not been two or even more creations before the last formation of the globe, which changing its geological and astro, uh, sorry, and atmospheric conditions changed also its floor, its fauna, and its men. This claim agrees not only with every ancient cosmogony, but also with the modern science, and even to a certain degree with the theory of evolution, as may be demonstrated in a few words. There is no dark creation, no evil dragon conquered by a sun god in the earliest world cosmogonies. Even the Akids, the great deep, the watery abyss, or space, hmm, was the birthplace and abode of Ea, wisdom, the incognizable infinite deity. But with the Semites and the later Chaldeans and fathomless deep of wisdom, becomes gross matter, sinful substance, and Ea is changed into Tiamat, the dragon slain by Marduk, or Satan, in the astral waves. In the Hindu Puranas, Brahma, the creator, is seen recommencing de novo, several creations after as many failures. And two great creations are mentioned, the Padma and the Varaha, the present, when the earth was lifted out of the water by Brahma in the shape of a boar or Baha avatar, creation is shown as a sport and amusement of the creative God. The Zohar speaks of primordial worlds, which perished as soon as they came into existence. And the same is said in Midrash Rabbi Abu, explaining distinctly in that the Holy One had successfully created, destroyed sundry worlds before he succeeded in the present one that does not relate only to other worlds in space, but to a, myster a mystery of our own globe contained in the allegory about the kings of Edom. For the words, this one pleases me, are repeated in Genesis, though, it, though in disfigured terms as usual. The Chaldean fragments of cosmogony on the cuneiform inscriptions and elsewhere show two distinct creatures and creations of animals and men, the first being destroyed as it was a failure. The cosmogonical tablets prove that this, our actual creation, was preceded by others. And as shown by the author of the Kabbalah in the Zohar, Sifra does, doesn't not getting that last name out. In Java, Jova Rabba, the Kabbalah states the same. Sorry, guys, I'm not okay with name projection today, as we can see. So be gracious. 
Onens or Dagon in Chaldean the manfish divides his cosmogony in Genesis into two portions. First, the abyss of waters and darkness, wherein resides most hideous beings, men with wings, four and two-faced men, human beings with two heads, with the legs and horns of a goat. Our goat men. Hippocentaurs, bulls with the heads of men and dogs with the tails of fishes. In short, combinations of various animals and men of fishes, reptiles, and other monstrous animals assuming each other's shapes and countenances. The feminine element they reside in is personified by Thaloth, Thal the sea or water, which was finally conquered by Belus, the male principle, and Polyhister says... Belus came and cut the woman asunder, and on of one half of her he formed the earth, and of the other half the heavens. And at the same time he destroyed the animals within her. As pertinently remarked by I. Meyer, with the Arcadians, each object and power of nature has its spirit. The Akkadians formed their deities into triads, usually males, sexless rather. The Semites had triadic deities, but introduced sex or phallicism. With the Aryans and the earliest Akkadians, all things are emanations through, not by a creator or a logos. With the Semites, everything is begotten. The water men, terrible and bad, she herself created from the remains of others, from the mineral, vegetable, and animal remains from the first, second, and third rounds. She formed them. The Diane come and looked. The Diane from the bright father mother, from the white solar lunar regions they came, from the abodes of the immortal, immor immortals, mortals. Yes. The explanations given in our stanzas are far more clear than that which the legend of creation from the Kutha tablet would give, even were it complete. What is preserved on it, however, collabor collaborates them. For in the tablet, the Lord of Angels destroys the men in the abyss. When there were not left the carcasses and waste after they were slaughtered, after which they, the great gods, create men with the bodies of birds of the desert, human beings, seven kings, brothers of the same family, which is a reference to the locomotive qualities of the primary ethereal bodies of men, which could fly as well as they could walk, but who were destroyed because they were not perfect. They were sexless, like the kings of Edom. We did have metaphors and allegories that what will science say to this idea of the primordial creation of species? It will object to the angels and spirits having anything to do therewith. But if it is nature and the physical law of evolution that are the creators of all there is now on earth, why could there be no such abyss when the globe was covered with waters in which numbers of monstrous beings were generated? Is it the human beings and animals with human heads and double faces, which are a point of the objection? But if man is only a higher animal and has evolved from the brute species by an inferior series of transformations, why could not the missing links have had human heads attached to the bodies of animals or being two-headed have heads of beasts and vice versa in nature's early efforts? We are not shown during the geological periods in the ages of the reptiles and the mam mammalia, lizards, with birds, wings, serpents, heads on animal bodies. And arguing from the standpoint of science, does not even our modern human race occasionally furnish us with monster specimens? Two-headed children, animal bodies with human heads, dog-headed babies. <laughs> Go search out your inquirer at the local grocery store today. And this proves that if nature will still play such freaks now that she has settled for ages into the order of her evolutionary work, 
monsters like those described by Barossas were a possibility in her opening program, which possibility may even have existed once upon a time as a law before they sorted out of her species and began regular work upon them, which indeed now admits of definite proof by the bare fact of reversion, as science puts it. I'm going to put a pause here. Now, for a scientific mind, somebody who can think scientifically or spiritually, I think they're both intersync now. If we look into certain genetic features, whether it be incest or not, and I'm just using that as, you know, there are things that happen genetically to people where, let's just say, people grow the werewolf syndrome, where their entire bodies is filled with hair, like their facial features, like everything is very hairy. And more so than like just fine hair on your arms, like everywhere is hair. Or people that they have the malformalities in, in their, uh, I forgot what that's called off the top of my head. Or they, you know, the webbed. I believe in mermaids. I believe a lot of us were mermaids in Atlantis. I mean, the creatures, the monsters, and I don't want to say the, these things are monsters. They're still of God's creation. Um, I mean, could you imagine? There are videos that I have posted. I don't know if I did the baby reptile one. I don't remember, but in the Anunnaki series, the Gray Alien Agenda series that I do, um, there is a video going around of a baby born that's like half human and half reptilian. Um, there, the SSP stuff as well goes into how they're hybridizing humans, but when it naturally occurs in nature, um where did that original dna strand even spring from and if we're looking at her work just bringing this to modern times and implanting it in your face hi how you doing if we were to look at that then a lot of that malformations of dna and how people come out in the natural sense not being tampered with how people can come out looking like werewolves or having one eye there are and they're not monsters they're beautiful i'm sure beautiful human beings that didn't ask for that but this is their lot in life and they chose it but where did it originally come from? And she's kind of giving us an insight here. And I really enjoy this. <laughs> and I hope you are too. Sorry, I had to pause there because the, the springing into where a lot of the DNA that we call junk or the DNA that when someone comes off with an extra chromosome or their feet are, are fused together or there's... You know, they don't look, they're human, obviously, but they're, or I don't like to say defects either because it makes them unique, but let's just keep the scientific terminology def defects. Um, it, it had to come from somewhere. It, it did have to come from somewhere. So... This is what the doctrine teaches and demonstrates by numerous proofs, but we shall not wait for the approval of either dogmatic theology or materialistic science, but proceed with the stanzas. Let these speak for themselves with the help of the light thrown by the commentaries and their explanations. The scientific aspect of these questions will be considered later on. Thus, physical nature, when left to herself in the creation of animal and man, is shown to have failed. She can produce the first two and the lower animal kingdoms, 
But when it comes to the turn of man, spiritual, independent, and intelligent powers are required for his creation besides the coats of skin and the breath of animal life. The human monads of preceding rounds needed something higher than purely physical materials to build their personalities with under the penalty of remaining even below any Frankenstein animal. Displeased they were. Our flesh is not there, they said. This is not fit. Rupa for our brothers on the fifth. No dwelling for the lives. Pure waters, not turded. They must drink. Let us dry them, says the Catechism commentaries. Quote, it is from the material worlds that descend they who fashion physical man at the new Manvaratas. They are inferior laya spirits possessed by a dual body in astral within an ethereal form. They are the fashioners and creators of our body of illusions. I like that. Into the forms projected by Laia, Pritris, the two letters, the monad called also the double dragon, descend from the spheres of expectation, but they are like a roof with no walls, no pillars to rest upon. Man needs four flames and three fires to become one on earth, and he requires the essence of the 49 fires to be perfect. It is those who have deserted the superior spheres, the gods of will, who completed the Manu of illusion, for the double dragon has no hold upon the mere form. It is like the breeze where there is no tree or branch to receive and harbor it. It cannot affect the form where there is no agent of transmission, mana's mind, and the form knows it not. In the highest world, there are the three are one. On earth at first, the one becomes two. They are like the two side lines of a triangle that has lost its bottom line, which is the third fire. Catches in book, book three. Now this requires some explanation before proceeding any further. To do so, especially for the benefit of our Aryan Hindu brethren, whose esoteric interpretations may differ from our own, we shall have to explain to them the foregoing by certain passages in their own esoteric books, namely the Puranas. In the allegories of the latter, Brahma, who is collectively the creative force of the universe, is said to be at the beginning of the yugas, cycles, possessed by the desire of and of the power to create, impelled by the potencies of what is to be created, Again and again does he at the oust of a capua put forth a similar creation. It is now proposed to examine the exoteric account in the Vishnu Purana and see how much it may agree or disagree with the occult version. Creation of divine beings in the exoteric accounts. In the Vishnu Purana, which is certainly the earliest of all the scriptures of that name, we find, as in all the others, Brahma assuming as the male god for purposes of creation, four bodies invested by three qualities. It is said in the manner, Maitreya, dawn, Ritra, night, Ahan, day, and Sanya, evening, and I'm butchering those, by the way, are the four bodies of Brahma. As per Parasara explains it, when Brahma wants to create the world anew and construct progeny through his will in the fourfold condition for the four orders of beings, term gods, Diane Kohans, demons, more material devas, progenitors, and men, he collects yoga like his mind. Strange to say, he begins by creating demons who thus take precedence over the angels or gods. This is no incongruity, nor is it due to the inconsist inconsistency, but has, like all the rest of profound esoteric meaning, quite clear to one free from Christian theological prejudice. He who bears in mind that the principal Mahat or intellect, the universal mind, literally the great, 
which esoteric philosophy explains the manifested omniscience, the one, the first produce brain high pr turn on the first product a pra padhana primordial manner as vishnu prana says but the first cosmic aspect of power brahman or the esoteric sat the universal soul the occultism teaches is at the root of self-consciousness will understand the reason why the so-called demons who are esoterically the self-asserting and intellectually active principle are the positive poles of a creation, so to say, hence the first produced. This is in, in brief, the process as narrated allegorically in the Puranas. Having concentrated his mind into itself and the quality of darkness pervading Brahma's assumed body, the Asuras issuing from his thigh were first produced after which abandoning this body it was transformed into night two important points are involved herein primarily in the rig veda the asuras are shown as spiritual divine beings their etymology is derived from asu breath the breath of god and they mean the same as the supreme spirit or the zolar astrian ahura it is later on for purposes of theology and dogma that they are shown issuing from Brahma's thigh and that their name being to be derived from a pri privative and sura god, solar deities, or not a god, and that they became the enemies of the gods. Every ancient theogony, without exception from the Aryan and the Egyptian down to the Hezad places in the order of cosmological I totally butchered that right there. Evolution, night before the day, even Genesis where darkness is upon the face of the deep before the first day. The reason for this is that every cosmogony except in the secret doctrine begins by the secondary creation, so cold, to wit the manifested universe, the genesis of which has to open by a marked differentiation between the eternal light of primary creation whose mystery must remain forever darkness to the prying finite conception and intel intellect of the profane and the secondary evolution of manifested visible nature. The Veda contains the whole philosophy of the division without having ever been correctly explained by our Orientalists because it has never been understood by them. Continuing to create, Brahma assumes another form, that of the day, and creates from his breath the gods who are endowed with quality of goodness, passivity. In his next body, the quality of great passivity prevailed, which is also negative goodness, and from the side of that personage issued the Pitrus, the progenitors of men, because as the text explains, Brahma thought of himself during the process as the father of the world. This Priya Sakti, the mysterious yoga power, explained elsewhere, this body of Brahma, when cast off, became the Sandhya, evening twilight, the interval between day and night. Finally, Brahma assumed his last form, pervaded by the quality of foulness, and from this men in whom foulness and passion predominate were produced. This body what then cast off became the dawn or morning twilight, the twilight of humanity. Here Brahma stands esoterically for the Pitras. He is collectively the Pitar, father. The true esoteric meaning of this allegory must now be explained. Brahma here symbolizes personally the collective creators of the world and men, the universe, with all its numberless productions of things, movable and seemingly immovable. He is collectively the pra Prajapritis, I butchered that, the lords of being, and the four bodies typify the four classes of creative powers or Daihan Kohans, Described in the commentary directly following stanza seven in book one. 
the whole philosophy of the so-called creation of the good and evil in this world and of the whole cycle of non verotic results therefrom hangs on the correct comprehension of these four bodies of Brahma. The reader will now be prepared to understand the real esoteric significance of what follows. Moreover, there is an important point to be cleared up. Christian theology having arbitrarily settled and agreed that Satan was his fallen angels belonged to the earliest creation, Satan being the first created, the wisest and most beautiful of God's archangels. The word was given, the key note struck. Henceforth, all the pagan scriptures were made to yield the same meaning, and all were shown to be demonical. And it was and is claimed that truth and fact belong to and commence only with Christianity. Even the Orientalists and mythologists, some of them no Christians at all, but infidels or men of science, entered unconsciously to themselves and by the mere force of association of ideas and habit into the theological groove, purely Brahmanical considerations based on greed of power and ambition allowed the masses to remain in ignorance of great truths, and the same causes led the initiates among the early Christians to remain silent, while those who had never known the truth disfigured the order of things, judging of the hierarchy of angels by their exoteric form. Thus, as the Asuras had become the rebellious inferior gods fighting the higher ones in popular creeds, so the highest archangel in truth, the Agath Agatha Demon, I never get that word name proper, the eldest benevolent, benevolent logos became the theology, the adversary was he dead. But this is warranted by the, cor the correct interpretation of any old scriptures? The answer is most certainly not. As the Mazadin scriptures of the Zed Vesta, the Vindada, and others correct and expose the later cunning shuffling of the gods in the Hindu pantheon and restore through Ahura the Ashuras to their legitimate place in the theogony. So the recent discoveries of the Chaldean tablets vindicate the good name of the first divine emanations. This is easily proved. Christian angelology is directly and solely derived from that of the Pharisees who brought their tenants from Babylon. The seductus, the real guardians of the laws of Moses, know, knew not of the rejected any angels opposing even the immortality of the human soul, not in personal spirit. In the Bible, the only angels spoken are the sons of God mentioned in Genesis, who are now regarded as a Nephilim, the fallen angels, and several angels in human form, the messengers of the Jewish God, whose own rank needs a closer analysis than heretofore given. Truly, how art thou fallen by the hand of man, O bright star and son of the morning? <laughs> now what do the Babylonian accounts of creation as found on the Assyrian fragments of tiles tell us those very accounts upon which the Pharisees built their angelology? But compare Mr. G. Smith's Assyrian discoveries and his Chaldean account of Genesis the tablet with the story of the seven wicked gods or spirits has the following accounts. We can print the important passages in italics. In the first days, the evil gods, the angels who were in rebellion, who in the lower part of heaven had been created. They caused their evil work, devising with wicked heads. Thus they are shown as plainly as can be on a fragment which remain unbroken so that there can be no dubious reading that the rebellious, 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 can't get that word out either, angels have been created in the lower part of heaven, that they belonged and do belong to a material plane of evolution, although as it is not the plane of which 
we are made cognizant through our senses. It remains generally invisible to us and is thus regarded as subjective. Were the Gnostics so wrong after this in affirming that this is our visible world and especially the earth had been created by lower angels, the inferior Elohim, of which as they taught the God of Israel was one? These Gnostics were nearer in time to the records of the archaic secret doctrine and therefore ought to be allowed to have known better than non-initiated Christians who took upon themselves hundreds of years later to remodel and correct what was said, but let us see what some what the same tablet says further on. I'm going to put a tiny pause here only because I'm excited. Why am I excited? Because we all fell. <laughs> we, my perception my perception upstairs okay god all god all oh, shit as soon as god itself the all the the creator manifested a thought sound vibration thus spoken into frequency and form color and in, in, in sound we fell all of us Now, if you if you come into neutrality and take the dogma and take what you know out and off the table, clear slate it, erase it, God's experience itself through all of us. And we live in polarity. There are laws to our universe. There is a construct to this time matrix. Okay? We're all playing a role. Now, when we ascend or have a physical death, if you were playing a role as a murderer, okay, but that's the experience that God wanted to have through you, okay, who is judging you? Yourself, because you're a part of God. Does it mean what going on in the world is right or wrong? It, it, it's, it, it's a shit show. Okay, but take the scale of falling into materiality. You fell from source. God, you're not with it. Now we're trying to obtain to get back to the all. Okay, we the, the hourglass, we are all up at the top at one point with source. And then we all started going down to the bottom. And now we're set back and we're going back up. That's all. When we take the notion of good and evil and bring it into a neutral standpoint, understand these, they have no power over you, number one, unless you give it power. Yeah. And... I could tell you because I know it in my essence, my soul, my being. The one they call the morning star guides me. And not just one component of it, but does that make me evil? Remember, we all have a shadow aspect and a light aspect to all of us. We are fractals. We are the diamond that's fractaled into all things. So another aspect of yourself playing another role in another dimensional space in a parallel wherever in the multiverse might be like Mao Zedong. But your conscious in this here and now, does that make you attach that entity, that fractal of you that's playing a role that's Mao Zedong? Um, is would is that bad would would just think about it you're a good person you're doing the righteous things you are walking the path to obtain godhood to ascend what 
when that other self merges with you, what are you going to think about yourself? We're all things. When you null and void, cancel it out. That it's just God having an experience. This is illusory. We give stories to things because that's how our minds operate. That's how our the structure in our brain receives information. We label and we we put everything in a in a category so that it's better for us to comprehend things. Okay. Take in stimulus in our outside world. But if you erased all of that and, and just took what they were saying, the notion of Satan and evil is null and void. We all fell from source. We all source needed an experience and we volunteered to be the experience. And thus all the creations were formed and we were the rock with like Dolores Cannon. We were all of this stuff consciously in an, in another form until we have we evolved and here we are so don't dismiss if you feel like you are one of those human animal things like i know there's people that can recall being a mermaid or an alien or whatever there's no judgment there and there should never be a judgment there because it's all of god source creator the infinite intelligence whatever you want to call it we're stuck in stories stuck in the past that's concurrently now occurring right in the theater near you it's happening now it's all now hi so when you recognize these things the stories that people tend to lean their truth on dissolves this is why i'm having a very difficult time trying to help people see pass through certain illusions because she, madame blavonsky is telling you right here stop feeding energy to a negative aspect because we gave it that story now it creates itself now it is manifested so you gave satan some crazy ass look and, and and powers now it manifests in our physical world because thoughts become things so when you kind of negate that clear cancel cut it out it's not going to show up for you anymore because you're not now giving it energy to come in that form it's all energy learn it i had sorry i had to because <laughs> i'm excited She's kind of telling me i'm on the right direction <sighs> There were seven of them wicked gods. Then follows the description of these, the four being a serpent, the phallic symbol of the fourth race in human evolution. The seven of them messengers of God, Anu, their king. Now, Anu belongs to the Chaldean Trinity and is identical with Sin, the moon, in one aspect. And the moon in the Hebrew Kabbalah is the Arga of the seed of all material life and is still more closely connected Kabbalistically with Jehovah, who is double sexed as Anu is. They are both represented in esotericism and viewed from a dual aspect male or spiritual, female or material, or spirit and matter, the two antagonistic principles. Hence, the messengers of Anu, who is Sin, the moon, are shown in verse 28 to 41 as being finally overpowered by the same Sin with the help of Bel, the sun, and Ishtar, Venus. This is regarded as a contradiction by the Assyriologist, but is similarly metaphysics in the esoteric teaching. Agreed. 
There is more than one interpretation for there are seven keys to the mystery of the fall. Moreover, there are two falls in theology, the rebellion of the archangels and their fall and the fall of Adam and Eve. Thus, the lower as well as the higher hierarchies are charged with a supposed crime. The word supposed is the true and correct term for in both cases, it is founded on misconceptions. Both are considered in occultism as karmic effects and both belong to the law of evolution. The intellectual and spiritual on one hand, physical and psychic on the other. The fall is a universal allegory. It sets forth at one end of the ladder of evolution, the rebellion, the act of differentiating into intellection or consciousness on its various planes, seeking union with matter, like I was explaining. And at the other, the lower end, the rebellion of matter against spirit or of action against spiritual inertia. And here lies the germ of an error which has had such disastrous effects on the intelligence of civilized societies for over 1800 years. In the original allegory, it is matter, hence the more material angels, which was regarded as a conqueror of spirit or the archangels who fell on this plane. They are the flaming sword or animal passions had put to flight the spirits of darkness. Yet it is the latter who fought for the supremacy of the consciousness and divine spirituality on earth and failed succumbing to the power of matter. But in theological dogma, we see the reverse. It is Michael who is like unto God, the representative of Jehovah, who is the leader of the celestial host, as a Lucifer is Milton's fancy, is of the infernal host, who has the best of Satan. It is true that nature of Michael depends upon that of, this, of his creator and master. Who the latter is, one may find out by carefully studying the allegory of the war in heaven with astronomical key, as shown by Bentley, the war of the titans against the gods in Hezad, and also the war of the Asuras against the divas in Puranic legend are identical in the same names. The aspect of the stars show Bentley taking the year 945 BC as the nearest date for such conjunction that all the planets except Saturn were on the same side of the heavens as the sun and moon, and hence were his opposites and opponents. And yet it is Saturn or the Jewish moon god who is shown as prevailing both by Hazad and Moses, neither of whom was understood. Thus it was that the real meaning became distorted. Okay. I'm going to leave this here because this is juicy. <laughs> juicy. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's a continuation. We're going to, we're going to read that for the next one. Um, I don't know who the other entities that I channel because it just flows through me. If I am channeling her, I, I thank you. Just channel better pronunciations of names. I, I'd be happy as a pig and shit. But I've been saying this stuff for a very long time and people think I'm wackadoodle. If you were to read 1984, now apply it to the ancient texts and apply it to now, there is not much that is correct in most things because someone got their hands on it and retranslated it or translated it improperly or didn't see the allegory or didn't see the other perceptions metaphysically that could be what we're trying to obtain. 
if you think in terms of science, we fell, all of us that are in consciousness right now in human physical form, fell. Our spirit, our soul, is already up and doing its own thing up there. In whatever plane of existence you want to give it. It's in density and in dimension somewhere. So we need to stop fearing or blaming these oppressors, these, I want to take over earth and all this nonsense. Yeah, did, 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 is that stuff real? It absolutely is. I, I believe it is. But there's a lot of misinterpretation and what agenda is being steered is what I'm concerned with because a lot of people are like, well, Dan, they're not getting bad. The Draco are bad and these people are bad and everything is bad. Everything is bad. What is good? Oh, we can't trust angels. We can't trust this. And so what is good? Someone explain to me, we all look for the bad and negate everything in this existence. I'm not saying everybody, but generally speaking, because we were brought up to a, an indoctrinated religion into a whatever our parents dictated to us, then we formed our own perceptions of the world and took our own viewpoints of things. And then, you know, everybody else is projecting at you. We collectively are not there yet to even have this full throttle to everybody because, oh, what is that? She was a nut. She's this. She's that. And this author is this one. And that it's like a twitching person. As Shannon Dean says that Archangel Michael is not good. Now, it's what energy you give to will and intent when you do your prayers. I'm not saying he's bad or good. I, I don't believe in any of that nonsense. They're both aspects. They have good and evil within them. That's everything. You're a battery. Okay. You have a positive and negative pole. You have a toroidal field. You conduct electricity. Okay. You have a positive and a negative pole within you. And so there's all these energies that we give names to. There's a good component and a bad component to all things in this perceived reality. So when we are only saying this, this one thing was like holier than now, well, do you, do you believe that? Like is Satan that evil? I don't believe so. I don't give it its power anyway, even if we wanted to say it is. I've seen the devil in the face many times. I've seen demons. I'm not bothered by them. I don't feed it. I don't feed them my energy. People project them at me. I don't really feed them. So they don't really have much power. They might do some annoying shit. But and I know I'm going off on a tangent, but where are you giving your power to things? And what stories are you not going with? Are you going with into your heart alignment to know if what she's saying is true? You might not agree with her paradigm and that's absolutely fine. For me, a lot of what she just stated makes absolute pure sense. And it's what I've been saying because that's what I heart align with. And it took me many years and a lot of study and a lot of perceptions and information to come at me to make a, a logical, rational tangent to go off of. To say, well, if I feel this energy that is an archangel that everybody deems is evil, but I am not perceiving it that way. I don't feel that way when that entity wants to work with me. I don't understand then why 
okay every there are people who play the adversary in their incarnations they're not always a horrible person they're just giving you the devil-edged sword they're giving you the other half of what you need you're they're the mirror that you need to see to learn from that's all it is so he came here to teach something very adversarial but does that make that energy maniacal? Seven heads, 20 million horns, fire. I mean, fire is cleansing. We call, I call on the violet flame. Archangel Michael's sword is flaming. It's flaming. So fire, breath, air, fire, life. I'm just putting this out there for anybody. I know a lot of people that actually read her work, like get it. But a lot of you who is just being exposed to her or gone through the millions of videos I did on the first book and it, it get, yeah, I can't pronounce it and it gets a little hard to understand the book. But I mean, th this is an easier book to grasp. Is she right? Is she wrong? It's up for you to decide. But I heart align with a lot of what that was just saying. And when we learn how to neutralize things, go into the alchemy and, and come into an alignment with self and go into the neutral zero point, we have to stop giving stories to everything and maybe write something better than fanciful misaligned words spell casting keep you in ignorance and when you can rise above the many different readings and the many different things that are implied and you come to your own conclusion, that's the only one that matters at the end of the day, not mine, not hers. But it's thinking in all perceptions, not just what you're programmed in with, because we were all programmed. So next time, next time, stanza two continued, the flames came. But I'm going to keep it here so I'm not over overwhelming, myself included. So guys, sending you all love, light, protection, shielding, grace, and compassion. Please heart align, do the work on yourself. Be the shoulder physically for somebody be the lighthouse you are very much needed in this time see your truths your perceptions because you never know where that tree or that flower is going to take root and have a beautiful and safe weekend thank you for coming sharing your time with me i appreciate it and i will see you guys on the next one Bye for now.